We're now to the last of the first of the last of the first of my lecture videos introducing you to the world of organic chemistry. In this lecture video, I'm going to teach you about organic functional groups and stereochemistry. Are you ready? Let's get started. So when a hydrocarbon has other atoms or groups of atoms stuck to it, besides just hydrogens and carbons, we call these atoms, or groups of other atoms, functional groups. Table 24.6, which is shown right here, lists several common functional groups. I've encircled the ones that are most important for now. Let's take a look at those. As I've stated before, molecules containing carbon-carbon double bonds are called alkenes, and that's their most exciting functional group while carbon-carbon triples are called alkynes. If you have a hydrocarbon that has an OH attached to it, it's called an alcohol. Hmm. Whereas if you have two alkanes that are tethered together by a single oxygen between them, we call that an ether. There are other functional groups as well, including haloalkanes and amines, as well as many others that are shown right here. As we analyze these, you should notice most importantly that the identity of the functional group will alter the suffix or prefix that you use in an IUPAC name for a molecule containing that functional group. I'm not going to require you, my students, to memorize these for this class. But if you go on to take organic chemistry from me, or from probably anyone, you will have to. I'd like to now conclude this slew of videos by sharing an interesting story of historical significance. Tetrahedral molecules whose central atoms are stuck to four different things have the ability to exist in two different forms which are called enantiomers. Now, just like your hands, enantiomers are non-superimposable mirror images. Now, let's pause for a moment and think about that. If you hold your right hand up and your left hand up, you'll notice that they are mirror images of each other, more or less. You'll also notice that they can't superimpose. That is, I can't turn over one of my hands in any way and have my pinky, my uh, ring finger, my nasty finger, and my pointer finger, my thumb all line up in the exact same way from one hand to the other. So in other words, they are non-superimposable mirror images. Thus, if you have any molecule that contains a carbon that's bonded to four different appendages around it in a tetrahedral geometry, you have a molecule that can exist as potentially one of two enantiomers, two non-superimposable mirror images. Such tetrahedral centers found within those molecules are called stereocenters and are sometimes also called chiral centers or chirality centers. Molecules that have chiral centers are often referred to as being chiral. We can see that in this cute little figure that I made myself. If you've got a molecule that has a carbon with four different appendages tacked onto it in a three-dimensional tetrahedral geometry, its mirror image will not be superimposable upon it, just like your right hand is not superimposable upon your left hand. We can see that further by looking at what I'm going to show you in a video right here. So here are two cute little wooden models that I've put together. I want you to imagine that each of these black colored spheres in the center represents a carbon atom. You'll notice that the geometry around each of these two carbon atoms is tetrahedral. That is, each of them are bonded to four different things. You'll also notice that the identity of those four different groups is the same around each carbon atom. That is, the carbon atom to the left is bonded to a red, purple, yellow, and blue sphere, as is the carbon atom to the right. So, they should be exactly the same, right? Uh, maybe. Let's take a closer look. As I take this molecule here to the left and compare it with the molecule to the right, you'll notice that they are mirror images. Are they exactly the same in every way? Well, to be honest, they're actually only exactly the same if I can move the molecule to the right around in such a way that all four of its groups are pointing three-dimensionally in the exact same direction as all of the correlating groups in the molecule to the left. Can we do that? Let's give that a try. If I take this molecule and I rotate it and I set it this way, you'll notice that I can get the red sphere and the purple spheres pointing in the same direction. But what about the yellow and blue spheres? Are they pointing three-dimensionally in the exact same way? No, they're not. So maybe I just haven't turned it around in the right way. Let's see if I can get the yellow and the blue spheres pointing in the proper direction. So I'll kind of twist this around here. And, uh, oh, there we go. Okay. Okay, now, totally we can see the blue and the yellow spheres are pointing in the same direction. Yeah, yeah, that's great. We solved that problem. Oh, wait a minute, wait a minute. Now what's going on? Well, you'll see that the, uh, the red and the purple spheres are not pointing in the same directions as each other either. Now, if I took these two models and manipulated them three-dimensionally in any direction or any way that I wanted, 
we'd actually discover that I cannot get them to be exactly the same. That is, I can't get all four groups around that central carbon atom in both molecules to point in the exact same three-dimensional direction. Thus, these two molecules are actually different. They are mirror images of each other, and they are non-superimposable. We call such non-superimposable mirror images enantiomers. And believe it or not, enantiomers are very important in biological or living systems, as is illustrated in an example that I will share shortly. That takes us to a very important question. Are the two molecules shown here really different? I want you to look at them momentarily, see if you can answer the question, and then I'll offer you an explanation. Well, if you look at them closely, you'll notice that they do indeed have a tetrahedral center, this carbon center in each. You'll also notice if you look at it closely that the tetrahedral centers in these molecules are indeed bonded to four different substituents. Let's look at this one to the left, for example. This carbon, having a tetrahedral geometry around it, is bonded to a hydrogen in one direction, a nitrogen in another direction, a carbon in another direction, and a different kind of carbon in another direction. Now occasionally new students are tempted to think that this carbon and this carbon are both the same because they're both carbons. From a three-dimensional standpoint, that is not true. This carbon down here is a CH2, and this carbon over here is a carbon that's double bonded to an oxygen on one side and single bonded to a nitrogen on the other side. Thus, they are two different kinds of carbons and therefore are structurally different. So indeed, this carbon is a tetrahedral center that is bonded to four different substituents. Analogously, this carbon over here is as well. So are these two molecules three-dimensionally different? Well, as you can see, the only real difference between them are these bonds here. The carbon-nitrogen bond at the molecule on the left is dashed, and the carbon-hydrogen bond here is wedged, and then they are opposite in the molecule on the right. Does that make them different? Three-dimensionally speaking, keeping in mind that these dashed bonds mean that this appendage is going into the plane of the screen, and this wedged bond means that this hydrogen is coming three-dimensionally out of the plane of the screen. These two molecules are indeed three-dimensionally different. I can prove that to you by looking at them in an alternative manner. I've redrawn the molecule shown up here to the left so that we can see it again. Now I want you to imagine that I have the ability to reach my hand underneath this molecule shown here to the right and flip it upside down. Now, if this were flipped upside down, I hope you can see that it would look like this. You'll note that if I flip it upside down, the bond from the carbon to this nitrogen, which is pointing out of the plane of the screen, if I flip the molecule upside down, would now be pointing into the plane of the screen. And the carbon-hydrogen bond, which is pointing into the plane of the screen, would actually be pointing three-dimensionally out of the plane of the screen. If you have difficulty seeing that, you're welcome to build a model. Now you'll notice, comparing the molecule to the left with the molecule to the right, that these two molecules are indeed mirror images of each other. Because each of them has a carbon with a tetrahedral geometry around it, bonded to four different substituents, these are two non-superimposable mirror image molecules of each other. Indeed, they are enantiomers. Now why in the world of all the molecules I could conceive of would I have picked these odd-looking structures to show you? The reason is because these particular molecules actually have a name and a story. Say hello to thalidomide. Hello. Now the enantiomer shown at the left is called S-thalidomide, and the enantiomer shown to the right is called R-thalidomide. You'll notice, as I've written here, that S-thalidomide causes birth defects, while R-thalidomide relieves morning sickness in pregnant women. Do you see any problems with those properties? Yeah. Yeah, I do too. So as it turns out, thalidomide was sold in Europe from 1957 to 1961 to treat morning sickness in pregnant women. Sadly, it was sold and used as a 50-50 mixture of both S and R enantiomers. Now that type of mixture is called a racemic mixture. Now as a result, many babies were born with birth defects, and the birth defect caused by S-thalidomide is malformed limbs. So the question is, 
Does the three-dimensional shape of a molecule actually matter when the molecule is being used as a medicine? Well, of course, the answer is yes. Now, as sad as this story is, there is sort of a silver lining to it. During the time that thalidomide was being used as a medicine in Europe and in northern Africa, an American pharmacologist and FDA official named Francis Kelsey refused to give FDA approval for the drug in the United States until further research had been done. Because of that, thalidomide distribution in the United States was limited, and as a result, there were very few thalidomide-induced birth defects here. In 1962, Francis Kelsey received the President's Award for Distinguished Federal Civilian Service for blocking approval of thalidomide. This is a photograph of her receiving that award from President John F. Kennedy. This is a classic example of one of the major reasons why an FDA is important. Having an FDA with all of its contingent screening requirements for developing medicines helps to ensure that the medicines that we use and buy in the United States have limited and known side effects. Now, of course, the FDA screening process isn't perfect, but it does do an excellent job of helping prevent disasters like this one from thalidomide. The flip side of it, of course, is that drug approval in the United States often takes much longer than it does in some other countries and the drugs end up being very much more expensive because drug companies are trying to recoup the costs that they've invested going through the 10 years and usually one billion dollars of research investment in order to get a drug approved. So do we like the FDA or not? I personally do, but I'll let you decide how you want to feel about it. So what is the point of my sharing all this stuff with you? Well, the bottom line is this. Carbon is found all over the place and plays a central role in allowing life to exist here on Earth. Because it can form four different bonds in tetrahedral, trigonal planar, or linear geometries, it allows molecules to have the structural diversity and versatility needed for the countless functions found in living systems. So yeah, carbon is found almost everywhere and can bond to almost any element, and often does. That takes us to the end of this lecture and the end of my coverage of organic chemistry. Please stay tuned to my next videos in which I'll begin giving you an intro to biochemistry. <laughs> Till next time, students, have an enjoyable rest of your day.